Hey biology students, in this biotechnology video, we're going to discuss the science of GMOs. So what is a GMO? Well, GMO stands for genetically modified organism. And the definition that we have from the US Food and Drug Administration or the FDA is that a GMO is an organism which could be a plant, an animal, a bacteria, et cetera, that has been created through genetic engineering technology, which means that the DNA of that organism has been altered. And I further define that here for you. So genetic engineering involves transferring specific genes from one organism into another or directly editing the genome in a very targeted, very specific way. So in the last biotechnology video, we looked at some techniques of genetic engineering. I introduced you to recombinant DNA technology, and we talked about how human insulin is manufactured inside of bacterial cells. So the concept of GMOs, though, definitely has um, a controversial nature to it in our world. So just a quick internet search, I could easily find um, protests, uh, pictures of protests all over the world where people are protesting GMO food. Um, you might have, might have seen this at some of your local grocery stores and restaurants where they advertise that they don't want to provide GMO food. and. This man here holding a sign that says, the world doesn't want your GMOs. <laughs> so a controversial topic. However, I would like to present you with the scientific perspective on GMOs today. And so let's think about what this man, what his sign would mean. So if the world doesn't want GMOs, does that mean the world doesn't want recombinant human insulin. In the last video, we talked about how type 1 diabetics require insulin medication in order to survive. They, they need it because their pancreas does not function and does not make the insulin hormone that they need. Back in the old days, before genetic engineering, it was very complicated to get enough insulin to treat patients where a lot of times this involved grinding up the pancreatic cells from animals in order to ex extract enough insulin. And so modern day technology that involves transferring a gene from humans, the, in the insulin gene, to bacteria for the purpose of allowing the bacteria to manufacture the insulin protein needed by diabetics is a pretty revolutionary idea. It's hard to imagine a world without that type of technology. The other thing I think that's important to consider when we think about GMOs becoming more widespread is our population growth. So this growth curve is showing the explosive nature of human popula population growth just over the last 12,000 years. This is really interesting to look at especially in relationship to people that I, that I know of in my family. For example, I know my grandmother was born in 1929 and she's still alive. And so when my grandmother was born, roughly 2 billion people in the world. And then here we are today, obviously we're 2020, but um, the 2020 census hasn't been completed yet. So in 2019, we're at 7.7 .7 billion. So that means that since the time my grandmother was born, population growth has more than tripled. So that is a huge, huge numbers. And there's a lot of estimations that in maybe 20, even just 20, 25 years, we'll be at somewhere around 10 billion off the charts here, 10 billion people in the world. And that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people to feed. That's a lot of people to keep healthy. We're going to need more medications. We're going to need more vaccines. We're going to need more food. And genetic engineering provides opportunities for all of those things. 
So a lot of people who are anti-GMO or have been influenced by the anti-GMO movement actually are confused about what a GMO actually is and what it is not. So I, I want to address that. So GMOs are not plants or animals made through selective breeding, and GMOs are not plants or animals fed hormones or antibiotics. So those are different situations. So if you know people that don't want to eat meat where the animals were fed antibiotics or hormones, and they say, well, that's all GMO. Well, that's not GMO. That's a different situation, okay, and a different um, problem to consider. Um, but that's not what GMOs are. And GMOs are also not selective breeding, which, by the way, is how farming works. So a common thing I've heard people in, within the anti-GMO movement say is just that GMOs are not natural. Everybody wants something that's natural, right? There's this influx of interest in whole foods and gardening and organic foods and all of that. So, so we want natural. Well, I think that's interesting because what is it actually, what does natural actually mean? Because farming, the historical practice of farming that dates back thousands of years ago is really not natural. Let me show you what I mean by that. So let's talk again, not GMO. So the next few slides, this is not GMO. This is the, this is the result of traditional farming practices from the past 10,000 years. So this is what a, the original wild carrot looked like. So if you want natural, if you wanna go back 10,000, 12,000 years ago to when farming practices began, well, it's not gonna look even like the carrots that you see at Whole Foods today you're going to see wild carrots that actually had these skinny white roots that were not very nutritious. Okay. And so what science, what the farmers did is because there's variation in every group of carrots that would be grown, some of those carrots just, just by spontaneous mutation, which is a biological and natural biological phenomenon, some of those carrots actually were a little bit different colored. And so what those farmers did was select for those seeds. So use those seeds and only plant those carrots that had, let's say, orange, produced orange um, roots instead of white roots. And so over time, people began to prefer orange roots as sort of the, the prevalent type, although there's different coloration patterns in carrots even today. And also there's a lot of vitamins. There's a lot of uh, beta carotene. That's, that's actually why it's orange. But the process of actually coming from wild carrot roots to modern day carrot roots, that is that took thousands of years, but um, it's a result of a selective breeding process of selecting for certain traits in the carrot plant. On the topic of plants continued, if we go back thousands of years ago, we wouldn't find broccoli. Isn't that interesting? Uh, we wouldn't find cauliflower, you wouldn't find cabbage, you, you wouldn't see any of this growing in nature, okay? None of this is natural. So if you go back thousands of years, uh, hold, hold on to that guy in a minute. <laughs> if you go back thousands of years, what do you find? You find wild mustard. So wild mustard is actually the ancestor of all of these modern day vegetables that you see on the slide here. So again, this is not GMO. Just to be clear, this is not GMO. This is the product of selective breeding. This is what people are talking about when they say natural farming. So natural farming uh, process is really, is really not natural either because that's not nature, letting nature run its course where everything would just be fields of wild mustard. Rather, uh, farmers would select for seeds where you would get um, you would get suppression of flower development in some of those seeds just by natural mutation processes. And then eventually we get broccoli, um, you know, where we get overexpression of certain traits. And so that's from painstakingly selecting seeds that have that are growing plants with sort of you know, different traits than some of the other plants, and then, then 
crossing, crossbreeding those plants over many, 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 many generations to ultimately get this variety of, of vegetables that you see. So livestock is the same story. This is a type of cattle called the Belgian blue. Again, notice it's on the slide of not GMO. This is not GMO. This is another example of conventional farming or selective breeding. So this animal wouldn't exist in nature. No, it is a product of actual, um, actually breeding, what, what we oftentimes refer to as artificial breeding, where if you have two parents of two cows um, that are very beefy in appearance or very muscular, and you have a bull that's very beefy and muscular, and if you artificially or, or crossbreed those, okay, um, by artificial insemination, then you can actually create beefy offspring, right? Because if you have beefy parental cows, their kids will be beefy and muscular like this. Well, after many, many generations of this type of sort of inbreeding, you eventually get the Belgian blue cattle, okay? But that's, again, crossbreeding. This takes time. Okay, this takes time and it's not very specific. So basically you're just breeding animals or breeding plants that have desirable traits and hoping that their offspring have those desirable traits. So you can see why this would be a, a lengthy process. Now I threw dogs in there as well <laughs> because dog breeds, well, guess what? That's not natural. You think you need, uh, these dogs would exist in nature? No, they're all derived from a wolf common ancestor, but we humans, we, we created dogs by selective breeding, by breeding dogs with sp specific traits that we deem to be desirable, coat colors or lengths of their tail or length of their legs, and we created these different breeds. So dog breeds are also not natural, but also not an example of GMO, because this process takes many, 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 many generations, okay? And so one of the things about genetic technology is that rather than taking many, many generations to get a desired outcome, genetic engineering allows for a very targeted approach, because now we can actually alter a specific gene in a laboratory rather than just breeding animals and looking at their offspring phenotypes and then crossbreeding those phenotypes and continuing that process. We can actually identify the specific gene we're interested in and alter that specific gene. And that is what scientists began to do. So now let's talk about what is GMO. So in the beginning of this slideshow, I, I showed you the definition, right? So GMO refers to an organism that has, its, has had its DNA altered by a genetic engineering technology, okay? So it's not selective breeding, it's a more targeted approach, but it's similar to selective breeding in that we're looking for a particular desirable outcome, okay? So there's in general been two uh, approaches to um, GMO crops, so GMO foods that have been manufactured. So the first is insect resistance. So in agriculture, there's generally two major problems that farmers face. One is that insects will want to decimate their crops. So what you're looking at in this picture is you're looking at a particular worm. It's called the corn borer. The corn borer worm. As you can see, it bores or burrows into the corn and eats it. It's tasty, I guess. So here you can see what that does to the corn. It decimates the corn. And so what scientists did, well, they inserted a gene into the corn and it's a gene called BT. So it's a BT gene. And this gene actually comes from bacteria, comes from a specific strain of bacteria, and it actually produces a toxin 
produces what we call the Bt toxin that kills insects. So it has a built-in insecticide. And the effect is, of course, the corn borer worm, if it tries to chomp down on the GMO corn, well, it's going to get a good dose of Bt toxin. And because the Bt toxin is toxic to insects, it will actually disrupt its digestive process and um, it will kill the worms. And so they, they won't eat it. And the, and the corn is now protected from these insect pests. So like I said, there's two major things that are a big agricultural problem. One is that we have insect pests. Now, notice that because the GMO corn has a built-in insecticide, this has actually led to a decrease in actually spraying um, insecticides or, or chemical ins insecticides on plants. So GMO crops have, because the, the plant itself makes the Bt, you don't need to spray excess chemical insecticides. Okay, so this has led to an overall decrease in insecticide use. Okay, chemical sprays that, you know, if you've ever tried to garden, <laughs> if you've ever tried to set up your own garden, I have several times, and every time it's the bugs come in and they just want to eat those strawberries or those tomatoes, you know, they get in there and they just decimate it. Well, the GMO crops have a gene alteration, comes from a bacteria, and it allows them to produce a toxin that is harmful to those insects. But notice it's, it's specific to insects. So a lot of people that have health concerns about whether or not GMO foods are, in fact, um, are they healthy for us? Well, notice here that this is a toxin that's toxic to insects. Very well researched. This is not a toxin that's toxic to us. It doesn't harm our cells. Our cells don't have the specific receptor that interacts with the Bt toxin. So it doesn't matter that you're eating a GMO corn that has a gene alteration that makes it so that the corn borer worm won't eat it. Um, that's going to have no effect on your cells, okay, because our cells don't have that specific receptor. So there, there is no concern there. And lots and lots of, of research has gone into that as well, trying to understand if these gene alterations, do they actually affect human cells or are they targeted to insect cells only? And it, it's insect cells only. Okay, so the second major type of GMO that we see today are herbicide-resistant GMOs. So that's the second big problem in agriculture. The second big problem is that there are weeds. So weeds, 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 weeds take over. <laughs> so if you have a garden, not only are you have insects trying to eat all your great food that you're growing, but then you have the weeds that come in and they they take up the area and they outcompete your crop and and then you have to get in there and you have to weed and pull them out and regularly do that. Well, what sci scientists have dis discovered is that we can actually create herbicide resistance as a gene. And so this is where you may have heard of Roundup. And so Roundup is a product that's marketed as, um, so it, it actually kills, so notice what it says here, it kills the weeds, but not the lawn. So you can use this on either crops or on actual uh, lawns, but what it does is it's toxic to weeds, okay? And it's toxic to weeds because it contains a chemical called glyphosate. That's the active ingredient. So glyphosate is toxic to plants, okay? 
just like the Bt toxin we were talking about with the corn is specifically toxic to insects, glyphosate is toxic to plants. It actually is an enzyme inhibitor, so it inhibits or blocks, inhibits a plant enzyme, so a specific enzyme that plants use in their metabolism. But notice, it's not an enzyme that we have. So concerns about, you know, are, is gly glyphosate toxic to human cells? They just haven't stood up to the test of science. Scientific study after scientific study has shown us that the action of the mechanism of how glyphosate works, well, it inhibits a plant enzyme, but we don't have that enzyme. So therefore, glyphosate doesn't have an effect on our cells, okay? That's what the research shows. So what, what uh, biotech companies have done is they've actually altered that enzyme. And so by making an herbicide resistant crop, well, that's a that would be the biotech company actually altering that plant enzyme. So therefore glyphosate would not work against the GMO, but it would work against the weeds. So it acts as an effective weed killer so in this picture, we're seeing before we have all these weeds growing and then after kills off the weeds and we only get our particular crop that we want to have growing here and um, it kills off the weeds. The crop that has to be genetically engineered though. So the crop would be altered so that the DNA of that particular crop has an altered plant enzyme, okay? How do they do that? How do they alter the plants, the plant cells? Well, it's actually using the same three steps that we described in the last video when we talked about how human insulin is made. This is one way they do it. They use a bacteria called agrobacterium. And this is a bacteria that actually invades plant cells. And so it's a bacterium where you can alter the plasmid. In the last video, we talked about what are plasmids. So this is a plasmid that you can alter it so you can add a specific gene. So if you want to add a new gene to the plants, like you want to give them the Bt gene, for example. So if we want to insert the Bt gene into corn, so you could use agrobacterium. Agrobacterium, you infect the plant cells with this bacteria that harbors the new gene. And so it will actually insert that gene into the plant chromosome. And so this new, the new trait will be present in this plant because now the new trait might be production of Bt. Of the Bt protein. There's lots of things in the toolkit of genetic engineers. So I broke it down on this slide. One, really cool enzymes. We talked about these enzymes in the last video, restriction enzymes, the molecular scissors of biotechnology, <laughs> where they can cut specific DNA sequences. This technology, CRISPR-Cas9, has been in the news a lot. If you follow any science um, news articles, this has been big in the last about five years or so. So I'm not going to go into all the details about this, but it's a genetic editing tool that's very highly specific. It uses a specialized enzyme, also involves a target sequence, so you can very specifically um, alter the gene that you want to in an organism. Gene delivery techniques. There's lots of gene delivery techniques that are used in biotechnology. This is a real thing. It's called a gene gun. It blasts the plant cells with these nanobeads that contain the DNA that you're interested in inserting into the chromosome. In the last slide, we looked at agrobacterium, so a species of bacteria, it's a natural plant pathogen. It naturally, its mechanism of action is actually to invade a plant cell and introduce a new gene into the plant. So if you just genetically engineer agrobacterium to carry the gene you want to deliver to the plant, then there you go. Uh, viruses can be useful. In genetic engineering, certain viruses are really good at inserting into the chromosomes. And so these have been genetically altered to deliver your target DNA into the plant. Plasmids, we mentioned this in the last video. So this is specific to mostly bacteria, but also yeast cells. 
So this circular piece of DNA, you can hybridize it with DNA from another organism, and then that can easily be swallowed up by a bacteria or yeast cell that you want to transform with the new trait. I want to share with you some other of my favorite examples of GMOs. Um, the Hawaiian papaya. I love this story. And this is super cool to me and demonstrates other applications of GMO besides just um, insect resistance and herbicide resistance, which is sort of the major two types of GMOs. But what happened was the story goes that in the 1990s, the Big Island of Hawaii, their major crop their cash producing crop is the uh, papaya, the Hawaiian papaya. Well, it began being destroyed by a virus called the papaya ring spot virus. On the left, you're seeing the non GMO papaya. It's affected by ring spot virus. So, this is a plant virus. It may be news to you, but uh, plants get sick too, not just humans with viruses. So, plants can get sick too. And if they get sick, they will die. And so you can see all these rings on the, on the um, exterior of this papaya. It's sick. It's a sick papaya, okay? It's going to die. It's also, its leaves get all wilted, okay? So you know it's, it's infected. Well, it, this, this particular virus spread like wildfire through the papaya population in the 1990s and nearly decimated this, this, whole, this whole economic system, like a a multi-billion dollar industry uh, there. Um, and so what scientists did is they created the GMO papaya. So the GMO papaya is genetically altered. What they did is they actually altered a gene. Um, they actually inserted part of the ring spot virus into the genome of the papaya. And that actually gave it almost like vaccinating the papaya the papaya became immune to the virus. And so on the right, you can see this is healthy papaya that is not able to become infected with the ring spot virus. And there's no, there's no health effects in humans. This was a big deal. There was a lot of protesting that went on in Hawaii where people didn't want there to be GMOs. Um, there's a lot of false information out there about GMOs, really unfortunate information because we live in a world where you can Google anything and you can look up anything online and, and people can lead you astray in what is actually not science-based. A lot of people say, well, you know, GMO, that's just companies trying to get rich, you know, trying to profit off the little person. I think golden rice is a really good example of the contrary. So golden rice is a genetically engineered rice that they've altered the, um, the genes in the rice to increase the vitamin A content. And they do that by introducing beta carotene. So here this chart is telling us for different, different lines of golden rice, how much vitamin A do they produce? And then what is the recommended nutrient intake, which is 50%. Now, what a lot of people don't realize is that um, vitamin A uh, deficiency is a, is a third world country problem. In places like India and parts of Asia, where people pretty much just eat white rice, white rice does not have enough nutrients in it. And a lot of people go blind from a deficiency in vitamin A. So the Golden Rice Project is a nonprofit organization that is trying to make a genetically altered version of the, of the traditional white rice that has more beta carotene in it. And it does make it yellow. Remember I said carrots also have beta carotene in it? So that's what it looks like. They faced a lot of protests just from people who are really just uneducated about what GMO means, um, but it does have the potential to introduce more nutrients into, into white rice so that it could be a better food source for the world. This was a fun one that I found, the Arctic Apple brand. Uh, brand. 
So earlier this semester, we talked about how apples can brown as a result of an enzyme reaction. Well, this company, the Arctic Apples, they have genetic, genetically engineered their apples so that they have silenced the enzyme. So they've removed the enzyme that's responsible for browning. So their apples never brown. Isn't that amazing? There's also other examples I could go on and on on this. I think GMOs are very cool and unfortunately misunderstood by the public. And you may not agree with me there, but I'm here to represent the science for you. And the science shows us really that GM foods, they have undergone rigorous scientific testing for safety. They've looked at both human health and the environment. And multiple, multiple studies from lots and lots of different organizations, public organizations, private organizations, it, the scientific consensus is that eating GM foods is nutritionally equivalent to eating conventional foods. There, there is no concern there. It, um, so claims made by certain special interest groups so you may see this label on a lot of your foods at the grocery store, you know, where people want non-GMO. Well, <laughs> a lot of those claims are really, they're just, they're just not supported by scientific, by scientific evidence. And lots of evidence on that. Um, there was a recent report that was published from the National Academy of Science where they looked at over 50 different research studies on GMO foods and their impacts on human health and the environment. And really what we find is actually GM crops has actually led to a decrease in the use of chemical um, insecticides, and herbicides. So it certainly offers a really important alternative when it comes to farming. It's basically the same thing that we've been doing for thousands of years, except with a more targeted approach. So that's it for GMOs today, and I'll talk to you later.